Now streaming on Johnny Carson TV. Hand-picked episodes from... Just a little off center. Really? Ah! This show is mortifying. Is there any truth to that? No. Oh. <laughs> we predict you'll love it. Chuck Hassan, you've played so many different varied roles in your life, and I suppose you get tired of some of the questions, but a lot of these, like the thing in the airport, require a lot of... Uh, Pre-preparation, learning to fly yeah, it's a 707. Kind of an interesting part of the work. And right? when they played Ben Hur, replayed it again here a couple of weeks ago. I watched the whole thing again because that was one of the great spectacles ever made, and you were superb in it. And of course, everybody's waiting for that great the Reds. chariot scene at the end, which was absolutely it was fixed. You know, fixed. Yeah, you knew I was going to win. But everybody says, "How did they do that?" And uh, very, very carefully. carefully. <laughs> because obviously, you had to drive in some of those scenes, yeah. in a great many of them. Yeah, most of it. Now, did, did you go to a chariot school? Because <laughs> most of them are closed, you know, now. There wasn't a hell of a hell of a big hall. little but demand for that. You don't get in the yellow pages and say yeah. chariot, chariot school. Yeah. That's true. I, I went over two months before we started shooting. I Fortunately, I had ridden and been around horses a lot right. in my life. But driving a chariot something else again. And I never had driven a team, let alone a, a four-horse team. Right. And I was spent two months learning to drive. A little bit. Some is, professional... Uh, yeah, Yakima Kanan. Oh, and yeah, the great stuntman who directs. directs. The greatest uh, stuntman, the legendary stuntman. Oh, right. He's in his 70s now, isn't he? Yeah. And still his son, Joe Kanan, is now the greatest stuntman alive and one of the best second unit directors alive. And Joe doubled me for the, the fall and, and doubled me for the stuff I didn't drive. But... Between his dad taught me to drive. It's one of many skills I've collected that for which I had no further use. <laughs> now, Anybody did, need a chariot driver? Yeah, you did the football. You played the uh, in number the one, aging quarterback I, uh, number I spent one. About uh, five months, not every day, you know, right. but over a period of five months with Craig Fertig of uh, SC, the quarterback coach of SC, and then down to the New Orleans Saints, learning to look like a pro quarterback a little bit. Right, and. Uh, Oh, I did a picture with Max Schell called Counterpoint, in which I was supposed to be a symphonic conductor. I uh, learned to do that a little bit. Again, to look like you can do it. And that took several months of, of work. And then when I did played Michelangelo, I had to learn to paint the Sistine ceiling. And then, uh, <laughs> you used a, a roller, did you? Walk there. <laughs> Fred Harrison said, what? He said, I, I've changed my mind. We're going to walk there. <laughs> Have you ever uh, had any injuries during uh, any of these things? I cracked a rib doing uh, number one. Oh, the football thing? Yeah. You know, pro football, probably you would. That was about the roughest thing. You well, it was, it was a planned shot, and those guys are superb athletes, you know. And they, But they've got to come at you, what, 70% or so, or right. it looks ridiculous. And they knew exactly what they were going to do. But I turned in midair, and a guy was supposed to catch me with his shoulder pad and lay off it. I... And he was off his feet, too, and he caught me with his helmet. And I said, you could hear the crack from the sidelines. Mm -hmm. And I lay, and I fell, and of course the wind was knocked out of me, and that bit where they come over and they're lifting your belt, you know, like this, and I, like this, and this guy comes over and leans over, he says, welcome to the NFL. <laughs> That's considered a minor injury, a cracked rib. They just put a little tape around you and send them back in yeah, half the time, and... When you, when you first started, it, it's always fascinating, and people are interested in, um, when they meet people who are, are so well-known and been successful, what they did in the early days, and uh, were there any times in your career when you were... You lived in New York, didn't yeah. you, uh, with the, your wife, in Lydia? Hell's Kitchen. Yeah, yeah in the, trying to get into acting. It was and a so nice forth. neighborhood. Then. Hell's Kitchen was a... Well, it, we never had any trouble. We had people we liked lived around us. I remember the fellow lived underneath us, rented a gun. Who no, rented he, a gun? No, he did. He never... He was on, he had no record, he was on no wanted lists or anything. He wouldn't dream of committing a felony himself. Right. But he would rent a gun. Just in case. Yeah, if you wanted to hold up somebody. I mean, you could rent the gun from yeah, him? that's right, yeah. That's, and that's no kidding. Yeah. But it was, it really was a nice neighborhood. We lived in a fourth floor. <laughs> it was. Sounds well, a guy who rents guns below you. <laughs> What'd you pay in those days in Hell's Kitchen? Ah, uh, $30 a month. 30 bucks a month. Uh, then I started doing movies, and we, we finally moved from there. When I realized, uh, by mistake, one year, I, I got a car, and I ended up with it back east, so I garaged it across the street from where I lived. And I suddenly realized, after about four months, I was paying more to garage the car than I was for the apartment. 
Did you ever get discouraged when you were trying to break into acting and saying, hey, maybe this is not the direction I want to go? You know, that's a funny thing. It's too insecure. It's a ridiculous way to make a living. It's impossible. I suppose most people's parents, usually if you find you're going into acting or theater, they say, oh, get a nice trade. Yes. You know, make waste baskets or something. Get a good profession. Yeah. But I can't, in other words, logically, if you're going to make a living acting, you're out of your mind because you can't do it. Right. But I can't remember going through that. I was reasonably lucky early on. Right. My wife got work before I did. She got a play on Broadway before I did and got a lead before I did. But I began to make a minimal living fairly early on. But I guess when you're 19, why you can absorb a lot of disappointment. Yeah, and if you get that measure of success fairly early, you'll say, hey, this is not too bad. It's going to make it. You're going to make it. Your son's in the marine biology, is he not? Down at UCSD, yeah. Yes, is that what he's going to do with his life? Yeah, he's uh, thinking of transferring to UCLA uh, next year, but we should be nice to have him home. But right. I know you have to leave uh, early tonight, and uh, but I know you wanted to mention something, and not to, to, to particularly leave on a downer, but it is worth talking about, because I read an article on this over the weekend, and the alarming thing was that you are uh, something to do with the suicide prevention. And the interesting thing I read, I think, was in the Los Angeles Times this week, that there's a great deal of that among the young people in this country, of, of high school and college age, which was not always so, but it seems to be one of the well, highest the rates. The frightening thing about this, two statistics that terrify me about suicide. One, it is one of the major causes of death in this country. While we've been talking, someone in the United States has committed suicide, for example, on this show. The show wasn't that kind of bad. Scary. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me, I'm sorry. I... I shouldn't have said that. I know what you're, you're trying to make the point, but uh, that is alarming. There must, what, 25 or 30,000 people a year, something like that? 30,000 a year, yeah. which yeah. is, uh, you know, what, about half the number of people that are killed in automobile oh, accidents. And it's one of the major sufferers of, from suicide are not obviously the, the victims themselves, but their, right. their friends and families. And about the only thing the suicide prevention people can give you to to deal with this is th th there's a lot of, of myths about suicide you know if someone says he's going to commit suicide he's not going to do it that's yeah. not true almost everyone that commits suicide so made a threat before right. time. and or people will make kind of inept attempts at suicide which clearly aren't going to work out and they say well it's a he's warning, just looking for attention of course he's looking for attention he's in desperate need of help right. and it, it's curious that it, this is kind of a if you can call a suicide a disease, and I don't know what else to call it, it's certainly a, a major killer, major health problem. Uh, the number of, of, of people that it affects, it, it makes it worthy of concern. And it's, it's something that, that is hidden still, the way oh, people with, with cancer right. or, or tuberculosis used, used to conceal that. They don't want to mention what a member of the family might have. But the worst thing you can say is, oh, his father had killed himself. Even yeah. even today, that's something no one ever wants to mention. Like it's genetic or something, which yeah. is not, of course. Yeah. In many uh, in many communities, I know they have uh, like self help lines, don't they, or hotlines for that if somebody is in a depressed mood or like that. That's that correct. There, there, there is there help are, that they can get. There are in most major cities uh, organizations that uh, that deal with suicidal depression, which is what what is the, obviously the cause of suicide, and it's uh, so people could probably check with uh, their local community or chamber of commerce, surely, and find out where that is. Because when you need that help, at least there'll be some place to get it, some some place to turn. I know. Good. Where are you off to now? You uh, well, I've got to work tomorrow, oh, yeah. and uh, shooting on the on the airport film. Right. And uh, when will that uh, be out? The later I think later in the show? fall. I'm afraid I'll be competing with myself again. I don't know that that's too good. You have them both out at the same time. Fred, that's the way it's going to work out. I hope. Give me a call when you want to play some tennis someday. I was yeah. just going to say, I hope to see you on a tennis court. I always wanted to beat Moses on a tennis court. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he's tough because all the guys kid him about it when, they, when he's taking them. You know, all he has to do is look up with a racket like this, and everybody goes, "Oh no, not again!" <laughs> and it's all over. And you say, "Look, Chuck, you want to fool around? You want to play tennis?" <laughs> right. Yeah. Thanks for being with us.